May 2025, news erupts across the globe. India hit $4 trillion GDP, a billion people celebrate, and rightly so. From $834 billion in 2005 to $4 trillion in 2025 is a remarkable achievement over the two decades of transformation. But question here is, does this $4 trillion number actually represent the true picture of the Indian economy? I asked this question to myself and the answer which I got rattled me. To get the answer, I made a small comparison with a country which had no hinterland, no resources and even no clean water to drink. I am talking about 1965's Singapore. In 1965, Singapore's GDP per capita was around 514 US dollars, whereas India's was around 120 US dollars. But now, with a population of just 5.8 million and with the overall GDP of around 564 billion US dollars, the GDP per capita of Singapore is above 90,000 US dollars. But where is India? India's GDP per capita as on today is just above 2,700 US dollars with a population of 1.4 billion people. So what happened? Both the countries starting almost from the same point, both emerging out of colonial rule, both starting with scarcity and immense internal challenges, end up worlds apart. It began with a single question. How can you bring economic development of a country when you have nothing to start with? This might have been the question in the minds of Lee Kuan Yew when he and his country, Singapore, was thrown out of the Malaysian Union in 1965. This is where our story truly begins. The first step, the audacious bet on the industrialization would set off a set of chain reactions that would carry Singapore from a swampy island to one of the most wealthiest and most efficient economies of the world. Back in 1965, Singapore was little more than just a swampy island, with no hinterland, no natural resources and just one port which handled barely a million tons of cargo. But when Lee Kuan Yew and his team was handed over this country, they saw not risk but an opportunity to build an extraordinary country. They began with the swamp. In 1961, under the guidance of Albert Winsomous, Singapore created the Economic Development Board with a bold mission to generate 200,000 jobs within a decade. Over muddy fields in Jurong, they dare to dream of factories, roads and livelihoods. Skeptics named it folly, but by 1963, the first factory stood. And by 1967, 153 factories employed 6,500 people, backed by $178 million in investment. But buildings were not enough. Lee recognized that bricks would not bring the prosperity he has dreamt of. Singapore needed world's capital and talent. A law in 1967 sparked the connection which Singapore required. A generous incentive. Exemption of tax up to 90%. Soon, names like Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, and G, and National Semiconductor were stamped on the Singapore's industrial ambition. Exports followed like clockwork. Jurong Port opened in 1965, handled its first million ton shipment by 1970. Between 1965 and 1973, Singapore's economy surged at an average of 12.7% per year. The momentum never faltered. By 1970s, 
Singapore's shipbuilding and chemicals became the staples of the industries. By 1990, Jurong Island, born out of reclamation, became the hub of the high-value petrochemical industries. By 2000 and onwards, Singapore planted its flag in finance, digital innovation, and biotech, all on a steadfast industrialization policy. The result? A robust, high-value economy capable of adjusting to the changes in the global economy. Singapore's exports are sophisticated. Its industries have evolved. Now, contrast this with the path India has traveled. After independence, India adopted the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956 with socially controlled economy and much maligned the License Raj. Though manufacturing did grow from 14% of GDP in the early 1980s to 17% by late 80s, but the output stumbled along 3.5% to 6% annually. Dependence on imports dried up, but zero integration with the global supply chains left the economy underpowered. Slow reforms in 1980s led to liberalization in 1991. All the industrial policies were scrapped and the doors were open for foreign investment. All the protectionist barriers were dismantled. Since then, many schemes and policies have been adopted by the various governments of India. But the results or the outcome has not been up to the mark. The manufacturing segment still contributes around 15 to 17 percent of the GDP and the employment has also not risen over the decade. India has taken steps and has tried to correct the course to bring the manufacturing's GDP share to 25 percent by 2025. But the bureaucratic bottlenecks, the infrastructure deficits and fragmented policies have caused hindrance in the progress. Whereas Singapore's gambit has compounded wealth over the decade. Singapore had already done the unthinkable, but Lee Kuan Yew understood something which other leaders failed to grasp. He once said that what gets you out of poverty might not necessarily bring you prosperity. Singapore's industrialization was the first miracle. But wages was rising. Competition was looming from cheaper countries like China and Vietnam. Question at that point of time was not that how do we build, it was how do we evolve. Factories weren't enough. Singapore wanted to diversify. They wanted to become a thinker, a designer and a financier. They didn't want it to compete with the cheapest countries anymore. They wanted to compete with the smartest. And that is where the next phase of transformation began. They started investing in finance, biotech, technology and AI. By late 1980s, Singapore's manufacturing engine began to hum more quietly. Growth was strong, but over-reliance on the labor-intensive factories started to plateau. Lee Kuan Yew's successors knew exactly the danger that was coming towards them. So they started to reinvent themselves. From the uh, factories of low-intensive labor, they started to move towards the high-value end products. The pivot began quietly under the Singapore Economic Development Board and Monetary Authority of Singapore. They analyzed the global trends and found that Singapore can lead in finance, biotechnology and high-tech manufacturing. The Monetary Authority of Singapore ramped up efforts to attract the global banks. By late 1980s, Singapore had already begun trading in futures, derivatives and foreign currencies. 
raising its profile in global finance. Meanwhile, the Economic Development Board offered pioneer status to the early entrants in biopharma and aerospace. The government laid all the groundwork, thus attracting the likes of Marx, Pfizer and GSK. The biopharma output soared to $18 billion by 2022, a threefold rise in the biopharma output from Singapore, thus anchoring the ecosystem of high-value industrial products. Parallel to that, Singapore launched master plans like IN 2015 and Smart Nation, building fiber optic infrastructure, sensor networks, and regulatory framework for fintech. Singapore moved its industrial base upwards from a low margin manufacturing hub to a cutting edge AI infrastructure and semiconductor fab. In contrast, India's story of diversification has been slower and less coordinated. The economic reforms of 1991 helped India's industries like IT, automobile and pharmaceuticals. But even distribution still remains a challenge, making India one of the largest but not wealthiest in terms of per capita. Singapore's reform didn't stop here because Lee Kuan Yew knew that a nation cannot be built only by factories and bricks. A nation is built by its people. So from the very beginning, Singapore invested heavily on its people. So let's now explore what kind of reforms Singapore took from time to time to develop its people to match the requirements of the country and come up as one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. After factories rose in Jurong and exports found its way to global ports, Singapore faced a new challenge. Who would power the rising demand of the factories? In 1965, the factories required basic skills. So Lee Kuan Yew and his team turned towards vocational training as its next essential ingredient. They began by embedding technical education into national school system. In 1968, every lower secondary boy would be given two years of technical education like woodcraft, metalcraft or fitting work. Girls could choose from technical school or home economics. The number of technical teachers surged from around 400 to 2000 by 1972. Not only that, metal workers, fitters, welders were all As the economy matured, Singapore needed more hands and minds. The 1970s and 80s, Singapore elevated its technical education through Polytechnics and Institute of Technical Education. Students from technical background or streams could pursue diploma in engineering, biotechnology, mass communication and more. After 2000, when Singapore reinvented itself and diversified its manufacturing segment up in the value chain, they also failed the requirement of diversifying or moving its focus in education from technical education to more advanced education. They partnered with global universities and offered masters in robotics, AI and also invested heavily in research and development. This evolution in education mirrors the industrial transformation from low-skilled workers to high-end innovators. All these requirements were fulfilled by a proper and evaluated education system which produced workers 
to research and developers time to time whenever there was requirement this resulted in skyrocketing of the productivity and resulting in narrowing the economic gap in comparison india adopted its national education policy in 1968 with a model of universal schooling and three language learning but the execution remained faltered large dropout rates persisted vocational training were not available and secondary school technical education dried up because it was not funded adequately industrial jobs continued to rely heavily on the on the job training it was after 2000 where schemes like skill india vocational training and college expansions got some amount of traction but still the integration or the amalgamation of the requirement of the industries and the training courses or education is still a mess for india there is a very little or no alignment with the requirements of the industry and the education that is being provided through even technical schools which singapore has adopted and mastered very early for their economic development so the bottom line is singapore's success wasn't luck it wasn't oil it wasn't land it was decisions the hard ones the bold ones repeated over decades apart from the other factors like investing heavily in infrastructure investing in housing corporations to build houses for its people and also focusing on clean and good governance singapore's success majorly relies on development of industries diversification of its industries whenever there was requirement and developing the skills of its people for the total and overall development of the country whereas india in spite of having natural resources hinterland and pool of talented people is still lagging behind in terms of wealth creation and gdp per capita so what do you think about this comparison please do comment your views and also don't forget to subscribe and give a thumbs up to this video because without your support i'll not be able to make more deep dives and make such comparisons for my next video i would thank for watching this video till the end thank you very much